Hey everyone, today we're going to be seeing if light can actually bump into other light. I have two lasers here. Lasers concentrate a lot of light into a small area. Now if I put one of these lasers here, we know that if I turn on this laser, it's not going to get caught or be able to knock this laser or anything. In fact, one of the beams doesn't interact with the other beam at all. So you can see I can move these beams in and out of each other and it doesn't affect each other. I can't knock it or move it at all. I can even shine a big flashlight and try to knock it and I can't. So what does this all mean? Well for one thing it means that if lightsabers are actually made out of light then it means they couldn't actually hit each other. Light is made up of photons and photons are the force carrying particles for the electromagnetic force. So for example if you have two electrons that are shooting towards each other, when they get close to each other they're going to repel and shoot this way. But the only reason they got repelled is because a photon shot off from one and hit the other one. This photon shooting off is the only way this electron knew to be deflected. Now what I just drew right here is called a Feynman diagram and it's a really easy way to describe particle interactions. So you can easily see and track each individual particle. But here's the thing, if you have two photons, one going this way, one going this way, it doesn't really matter, they don't interact with each other, they can't hit each other because photons don't interact with other photons normally. So it doesn't matter how many you pack in one spot, they don't interact with each other. So we know intuitively that two light beams can't run into each other or affect each other in any way. But that's not exactly true. One of the weirdest things in modern physics is that particles don't always stay the same particle all the time. For example, sometimes a photon can just be going along its merry way and then it can turn into an electron and a positron. That sounds really weird, but it's actually just the reverse process of saying that a positron and electron hit each other and annihilate each other to become a photon. So what this means is that sometimes, very rarely, you can have two photons flying through space and when they get near each other, they both happen to annihilate and turn into electrons and positrons and those electrons and positrons then turn into a different photon of light. So this means you can actually have light that scatters light. This type of scattering is called Delbruck scattering and it's literally light interacting with other light. And it does it through these quantum fluctuations that happen. Now this scattering of light by light has never been observed in a vacuum, but it actually happens all the time in nonlinear crystals. It provides a setting where these photons can more easily interact with each other through these vacuum fluctuations. One of the ways that light can interact with itself in these nonlinear crystals is called frequency doubling. In frequency doubling, what happens is you send in two photons of light, they annihilate, and then they exit as one single photon of light. Only this photon of light that exits has double the frequency of the two photons of light that came into the crystal. Now you might not be thinking it's that cool to get a different frequency of light on something when you shine it through a crystal. For example, you can see that I can shine blue light on this green glow in the dark material and it's green afterward. But notice one thing, I can't shine red light on this green glow in the dark material and get green. So normally if you have light that changes color when it hits something, you can only go down in frequency, you can't go up. Because going up means you need more energy to do that. So how is it that the nonlinear crystals can go up in frequency? Well, it's because you're actually adding the energy and momentum from two photons together and getting one photon to come out of it. And that photon has the exact same energy and momentum as the initial two photons that went into it. Now, all of this sounds really cool and theoretical, and it seems like you probably won't be able to see this for yourself. But actually, you can see it all the time if you've ever had a green laser pointer. So a green laser pointer doesn't actually have laser light that's green to start out with. It takes light in the infrared range and turns it into green light, so it raises the frequency of it. And the way it does it is by using a nonlinear crystal inside of it. For example, I've cut open this green laser pointer here, and you can see the inside of it. You can unscrew this outer portion here, which is just a bunch of lenses. And once you open it up, you get something that looks like this. On top of this is actually the nonlinear crystal with another lens on top of it. And you can take it right off. So you can see the tiny little crystal inside of there, right in the corner. So inside of this is the laser diode. And this is a laser diode that's actually shooting out infrared light at 808 nanometers. So 808 nanometers is just on the verge of being able to see the red light. 
If I shine it in the camera, cameras actually do pretty good at picking up infrared light. So you can see that light inside of there. So that's the infrared light coming out of the laser diode in there. So we now have infrared laser light coming off of here, but watch what happens when I put the nonlinear crystal in front of it. It turns it into a green laser light. Get it in just the right spot. Look at that. <laughs> I now have a green laser. So the way this actually works is first that 808 nanometer light gets turned into 1064 nanometer light and then it goes through the nonlinear crystal and that nonlinear crystal splits that wavelength up into 532 nanometer light. So it has exactly half the wavelength of the 1064 nanometer light going into the crystal. The way that this is able to work is called second harmonic generation and it turns out that frequency doubling isn't the only thing that second harmonic generation can do. In fact, you can even do something called frequency summation where you add one frequency plus another one and you get the output frequency. Now this second harmonic generation is extremely useful for making any frequency of laser light that you want. But another thing that's really useful is you'll notice that in this situation we turned infrared light into visible light. And it turns out right now we don't have a way to detect single photons of infrared light. So if you want to detect if there's a single photon of infrared light, you can send it through a nonlinear crystal, it can turn it into visible light, and then you can detect those single photons coming through. And thanks for watching another episode of the Action Lab. I hope you liked it. If you did, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't yet and hit the bell so you can be notified when I release my latest video. And check out theactionlab.com where I sell two of my science boxes. It's a self-pouring fluid box and then the other one is a vacuum chamber box. We're almost out of stock of these, so if you want them, you better get them now. And thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.